I I am doing uh, some of the readings from C.S. Lewis's book The Four Loves and we're in the chapter on affection and here he's talking about jealousy but a particular kind of, of jealousy he says Every kind of love, almost every kind of association, is liable to it. The jealousy of affection is closely connected with its reliance on what is old and familiar. We don't want the old, familiar faces to become brighter or more beautiful, the old ways to be changed even for the better, the old jokes and interests to be replaced by exciting novelties. Change is a threat to affection. So we might want to think about that. Do we, I mean, I, I don't like change. I've never liked change, but we know that things don't stay the same. And are we prepared for change? And do we prepare our children for changes that will, will happen in their life? Here he gives a... a a connection between siblings and changes that happen with them. A brother and sister, or two brothers, for sex here is not at work, grow to a certain age, sharing everything. They have read the same comics, climbed the same trees, been pirates or spacemen together, taken up and abandoned stamp collecting at the same moment. Then a dreadful thing happens. One of them flashes ahead, discovers poetry or science or serious music, or perhaps undergoes a religious conversion. His life is flooded with the new interest. The other cannot share it. He is left behind. I doubt whether even the infidelity of a wife or husband raises a more miserable sense of desertion or a fiercer jealousy than this can sometimes do. It is not yet jealousy of the new friends whom the deserter will soon be making. That will come. At first it is jealousy of the thing itself, of this science, this music, of God, always called religion, or all this religion, in such contents, contexts. The jealousy will probably be expressed by ridicule. The new interest is all silly nonsense, contemptibly childish or contemptibly grown up. Or else the deserter is not really interested in it at all. He's showing off, spanking. It's all affectation. Presently, the books will be hidden, the science specimens destroyed, the radio forcibly switched off the classical programs. For affection is the most instinctive in the sense of the most animal of the loves. Its jealousy is proportionately fierce. It snarls and bares its teeth like a dog whose food has been snatched away. And why would it not? Something or someone has snatched away from the child, I am picturing, his lifelong food, his second self. His world is in ruins. But it is not only children who react thus. Few things in the ordinary peacetime life of a civilized country are more nearly fiendish than the rancor with which a whole unbelieving family will turn on the one member of it who has become a Christian, or a lowbrow family on the one who shows signs of becoming an intellectual. This is not, as I once thought, simply the innate and, as it were, disinterested hatred of darkness for light. A church-going family in which one has gone atheist will not always behave any better. It is the reaction of a desertion, even to robbery. Someone or something has stolen our boy or girl. He who was one of us has become one of them. What right had anybody to do it? He is ours. But once change has thus begun, who knows where it will end? And we, all so happy and comfortable before, and doing no harm to no one. 
So I, I, I do remember when I left the witnesses that expression being made by a family member. We had it made, you know, like we had spoiled something by, uh, by what we'd found out and, and by uh, wanting to, to, to not just put up with something that we knew was wrong, uh, changing a direction. And it is an irony that as Jehovah's Witnesses, we were told to prepare people when we buy, did a Bible study with them to the fact that they would be persecuted or oppressed by their family members for studying with us. And yet, when someone who is a Jehovah's Witness finds something outside of the watchtower or shows an interest in something outside of watchtower, he's, he's behaving the, the very way that he's criticizing the outsider that becomes a student of the witnesses is going to experience. He starts to behave the very same way. I just thought that was kind of ironic. And I guess uh, in reading this scenario of, of children and how that happens, that switch where sometimes their interests go in different directions and it causes a feeling of desertion, you can understand that. So I think this would help us to be maybe a little more s sympathetic to, to people who are still witnesses and have family members who leave. We can understand their feeling of being deserted or rejected, just like we ourselves feel deserted when we leave because they, they will cut us off, and they have cut us off. I'm going to um, link to a video that, um, oh actually there was another point I was going to make. Uh, the, the, the problem only exists because as witnesses we were dependents. And when you are a dependent you've already broken the first commandment because you're not loving God with your whole heart, soul and mind. You're letting someone else dictate to you. So you're dependent on their point of view. And when you think you already have truth, it, it, you can't tolerate change. So now, I'm not threatened by, by someone holding a different opinion or my having to perhaps change an opinion. It's not, uh, it's not a threat anymore because truth is what's important and being truthful and honest and following your conscience is more important than uh, well, I, I'll just leave it there. It's more important. So I, I'm going to link to um, a video called it's one that we did uh, based on, on uh, Ray Franz's book and it was called Freedom Lovers J.W. Org and J.W.'s would persecute Wycliffe and Tyndale. And a second video that was based on our readings from uh, J.C. Ryle's book on Matthew and the studies of that. It was, Why Were Jewish Christians Persecuted? Unlike J.W.'s, they continued to worship with non-Christians. <laughs> 